Hi divers, this is Alec Pierce. I'm coming to you from Scuba 2000. This is not one of my tech tips. This is our very first episode. Is that right, Kev? First episode in our vintage scuba playlist on the Scuba 2000 channel. I hope you guys enjoy this. I've had a lot of questions, a lot of comments about my vintage collection and uh, just comments and questions generally about vintage equipment. And so we decided to, Kevin decided, to start this new playlist on vintage equipment in an effort to demonstrate and display some of my vintage collection and maybe share some ideas with you that will tickle your fancy, make you laugh a little bit, and maybe give you some appreciation for the sport of scuba diving. Let me establish my credentials first of all. This is me. Yes, that is me. I know I've got a lot of hair in this picture, but I used to have a lot of hair. And uh, this is me in 1965. 1965, I was already been diving for several years, certified in uh, 1960, started diving in 58. That's um, 58 years ago. My gosh, it even scares me. And uh, this is diving at Fenton Falls. My dear mother took this picture. There were no divers in those days in the small town where I lived in Ontario. So I dove by myself. My mother was my dive buddy. She sat on the shoreline and knitted. And I had a little, uh, a little orange float. And I said to her, Mom, if uh, I get into trouble, I'll let that go. It'll pop to the surface. You call the police. There was no 911 in those days. There was no emergency services. The police did not have a dive team, but I figured that the police would know what to do if I didn't come up. So she was my dive buddy and she took this picture. It was a different world than we have today. In a lot of ways it was nice, but uh, let me talk to you about the vintage gear and how things have changed over the years. And you'll begin to appreciate that even though I've been diving in the old days and really, really enjoyed it, Scuba diving today is just fantastic for you folks just getting into the sport of scuba diving. Today I want to concentrate on masks. Mask, in my opinion, is the single most important piece of equipment you'll ever own. Your mask needs to work well. It needs to fit and be comfortable, allow you to see and to dive safely and comfortably. If it doesn't, you're not going to have a good dive, so you won't enjoy diving and you won't dive and it's over. That's why I say the mask is most important. Masks have changed a great deal. This is a modern mask. Take a look at this, Kevin. Silicone, clear silicone, doesn't tear, doesn't rot, doesn't dry out, nothing goes wrong with it, great straps, you pull to make it tighter, lift the knob to make it looser, it's close to your face, <coughs> somehow, close to your face, it's easy to equalize, just a beautiful mat, light and small, and fold it up and stick it in your dive bag and knife. That is a modern mask. They didn't start out that way. Trust me, let me show you, okay? Let's go way, way, way back. Let's go back to the 50s. Let's go back <clears throat> to a time in Southern California where the sport of skin diving started. Yes, we used to be called skin divers. The word scuba had not been invented. So people who had scuba tanks, as we call them today, people who had tanks, compressed air tanks, were called lung divers. Lung divers, that's right, they were lung divers. And the rest of us were skin divers because we didn't have a tank on our back. In fact, there was a regulator made by Voigt, big company, called the Lung. I'll show you that sometime. It's a pretty neat regulator and has a very special uh, uh, meaning to me because that's a regulator that, that Mike Nelson used in the TV series Sea Hunt, which I'm also going to talk about on our Sea Hunt playlist. However, let's go back to the early 50s. There were no masks. You couldn't call up your local dive store and, uh, and say, hey, I want to buy a new mask. You got it. And they'd say, yes, we have lots of masks come in. And you couldn't do that. There were very, very few places where you could get a mask. There were a few in Europe and so on. In fact, in those days, in the 50s, many people made their own equipment. You've heard me talk previously on Tech Tips about do-it-yourself. And there was actually articles on how to make your own mask. Well, that'd be silly. Why would somebody make a mask? Well, because, as I've said, there were no masks available. There was no dive store. You couldn't go in and choose a mask. There were no dive stores. And if there was a dive store, it had two masks. They both looked exactly the same. They were both, they were both black. And... That was it, your choice. So a lot of people made their own masks. Also, the masks in those days were expensive. They were like $6, $7, $8, $10 for an expensive mask. That's a lot of money. A guy could work for two or three days to earn $10. So a lot of people made their own masks. Let me show you one of the very first masks in North America. This particular mask was called a Charlie Sturgill diving mask, the Sturgill mask. It's quite famous among vintage divers. This is one of only three that we're aware that still exist in the world today. Charlie Sturgill was a member <clears throat> of one of the very first dive clubs in the world, and certainly in North America, the Bottom Scratchers in Southern California. And uh, he had a unique uh, ability. First of all, he was a firefighter, so he had access to rubber 
fire hoses. Secondly, he was very handy with tools. He was a little bit of a silversmith. So what he would do for the club members, if you were fortunate not to be a club member of the bottom scratchers in the 50s, he would say, you want a good mask, I'll make you a mask. And he would make a mask to fit to your face. He would get a piece of fire hose. That's what this is. You can see how thick this rubber is. It's a thick piece of fire hose. And you would meet at a club meeting once a month, and he would bring a piece of fire hose, and he would fit it to your face. He'd mark it, and then he would go home. And he would grind and cut and so on until he thought the fire hose was the perfect fit. The next meeting, a month later, he would come back and try it on your face and make a few adjustments, take it home, adjust it a month later. So it might take you three or four months to get your Sturgill mask. Once he had this face portion, it's going to fit your face, then he would insert the plate plate of glass, not tempered, just a plate of glass, and he would make out of steel, the stainless steel, this nice ring with a nut and a bolt on the top to hold it together, and these really nice plates, silver solder to the side, and there was a strap that he made as well out of, out of rubber that fit into the Charty Sturgill dive mask. First production mask, we'll call it production, there were probably about 50 of these made, that's a guess, uh, in dealing, talking to my very good friend, Dr. Sam Miller in California, uh, who is also a, a pioneer of diving. He tells me that there are only a few of these left in the world, three that we know of for sure. Um, I'm going to brag a little bit and say that mine's the best. But anyway, I have your letter from, from Harry Vetter, who was a member of the Bottom Scratchers. And Harry Vetter, by the way, to establish his credentials, he was now the instructor number four. That's right. Now we instructor number four in this letter transfers ownership of this very special mask from him to me with a letter explaining what I've just described to you. So it's a beautiful mask, very, very old, not really used today like this, but this was one of the very first masks. Now, let's go to production masks. Let's, let's go to a scuba company. Let's pick a mask out of the, off the table here. Here's a mask. Look familiar? Well, sure it looks familiar. It's almost exactly the same. Round, black rubber, band, screw on the top, glass in the front, and a strap. It's almost an exact copy of the Sturgill mask. There have been some very slight improvements on it, but not many. Here's another one, production mask, made by Healthways, this company. Round, glass, metal band with a screw on the front, strap on the sides, and almost exactly the same, this heavy, heavy, thick rubber. If it fits your face, you were lucky. If it didn't fit your face, well, you would scrunch your face and force it on and make a seal. Beautiful, old, old masks. Now, these old masks were different from modern masks in many, many ways. First of all, they're all made of black rubber. They're not anymore. Uh, secondly, they're always black because they couldn't put color into it successfully. Thirdly, and the most obvious difference is that the seal on the inside was a single seal, just a rubber seal. It stuck on your face, and hopefully it sealed and kept the water out. Today, modern masks have a double seal. There's a seal on the outside edge. There's another seal on the inside edge, so they have a double seal, and you'll see in just a minute how that double seal came into, into uh, uh, existence. So this was a typical type of mask we used many, many years ago. Now, these masks were not perfect by any stretch. First of all, they leaked. It doesn't matter how hard Charlie tried, the mask was not a perfect fit, and they would leak. Even the production masks that came out from some of the early companies, Healthways and Voight and Aqualung and those companies, uh, leaked quite often. So first of all, you had to get rid of the water. Of course, we used the same methods we do today, tipping back and blowing and so on. But it was very popular in the early days to put in a purge valve. So some of these masks have a purge valve. A purge valve is simply a one-way valve mounted on the front of the mask. There's one, and there's another one, a nice little yellow inserted in there. Purge valves were very, very common. I have lots of purge valves. You'll see some more in just a minute here. And the purge valve was just one-way valve mounted in the front. And when you got water in your mask, very common is a rubber mask because they were dry out and they didn't seal well. Then you tip your head forward. That's kind of weird. Today, to clear your mask, you learn to tip your head back. But anyway, with a purge valve, you tip your head forward so that the water collects behind the purge valve. And then when it's sitting in there in the purge valve, you would just blow out through your nose, and the increased pressure would blow the water out through the purge valve. Sounds great, doesn't it? Eh, it worked not too badly until a piece of sand got caught in that purge valve, and then the purge valve let water in. It was far from perfect. The other thing is missing in these very early masks, both Charlie Sturgill mask and the early mask, is any way to equalize. You couldn't equalize, you see. On a modern mask, the nose pocket sticks away out. So that you can easily grab the nose with your fingers, whether on scuba or skin diving, you grab your nose and hold your nose and equalize. 
So in the early days of scuba diving, uh, we, we didn't have that in the mass. <clears throat> we had to equalize somehow. Uh, very commonly, we would swallow. Swallowing helps. Sometimes I felt as if I had swallowed an entire, entire Lake Scugog that was up near Lindsay uh, by the end of the dive, and I would burp for a half a day afterwards. But anyway, you could swallow back and forth like that, and the various other ways that we had. It was very difficult to hold your nose. So mass, fairly soon, they started to include some way to uh, hold your nose. Take a look at this mask and you'll see very similar. It's on the inside the glass, but inside you see in there, you can reach up underneath and there's two pockets and your nose sat in here like so and you would squeeze your nose. And then you can hold your breath, blow a little bit and equalize. Now here's a little later mask, almost exactly the same style, glass, rubber, strap, metal band. But these uh, nose pockets are corrugated or expandable like a little bellow so your nose is in here and you can squeeze your nose and blow. Pretty neat, huh? It wasn't easy to do that when you had a scuba regular in your mouth. So some companies come up with a neat idea. One of the early companies came up with a neat idea was this company. So they had a mask, and this one is actually colored blue. We'll talk about that in a moment. Otherwise, it's the same glass, skirt, strap, metal band, all the same. And inside, look, at there's two pockets in there, but they're narrow. They're very narrow. You can't get your fingers in there. You don't need to, though, because on the outside, there are two metal clips. Watch. As you squeeze the metal clips together on the outside, it squeezes your nose on the inside. So squeeze your nose, equalize, and let go. Pretty slick. That was actually a pretty neat idea. Uh, several companies did that. Here's another one, another old mask. Single seal, hard rubber, little purge on the in, purge on the outside, and you can squeeze on the outside, squeeze your nose, and hold it shut. Here's a big mask. Look at this one. Reminds me of my 56 Buick. Big windshield with windows on the side. The same thing. They were really trying to get fancy now. And this has a purge, a little purge on the bottom for getting water out. And the big nose pockets inside. But again, it has the metal clips on the outside. Watch. I squeeze the metal clips. And you can squeeze your nose. Your nose sits in here. Just like that. Neat idea, huh? And it worked a little bit. It wasn't far from perfect, but it did work. So that's how mass developed very, very slowly. And then eventually, they discovered that having this great big windscreen actually did not give you the best vision. You're best to have the lenses close to your eyes. So they started to change and the lenses moved in close to your eyes. And, and at the same time, of course, the nose pocket went out. And so pretty soon you were able to squeeze your nose with your fingers and equalize easily. Let me show you some other masks that came along. We'll just scoot, scoot along here a little bit. Here's another old mask, pretty neat. <clears throat> kind of like my 56 Buick again. Look at this. One piece windshield. It's just, it's just like a windshield. Look at it there. Boy, oh boy, could you ever see it like looking in an aquarium. And again, this particular mask has those nose pockets. You can reach up inside and squeeze your nose to equalize. There's a neat one. Now, these masks were actually pretty popular. This was an odd-looking mask. This is called the Pinocchio. And it was one of the early attempts to get the lenses close to your eyes to give you better vision. Also, to reduce the volume. I mean, my goodness, if this mask got flooded, you had about a gallon of water in there <laughs> that you had to get out. It took a lot of breaths to clear the water out of that mask. This mask is much smaller, like today's modern mask, much, much smaller in volume on the inside, so it's much easier to clear. Again, it had a nose pocket. You see, it's getting starting to get a nose pocket now, like a modern mask. But an odd shaped lens, in fact, it was so odd that they had to put a wire across there to hold the whole thing together so it wouldn't come apart. This was a similar style, same company. <clears throat> But as you can today, if you look closely, you'll be able to see that this Pinocchio mask has prescription lenses in it. Yeah, it's actually got a prescription lens, so people whose eyesight wasn't absolutely perfect, they could go scuba diving and see really well. What we used to do if, you're, if, if you wore glasses was we would take a mask like this, we'd take an old pair of glasses, break the arms off or take the arms off, put the glasses inside and hold it in with tape or maybe some strips of foam neoprene, block it in there. So we put the mask on, and there's a pair of glasses in there. It looked kind of googly, but who cared? We were scuba divers, so it was fantastic. Another old mask like this one with the little lenses as well. This is European made, and these lenses actually unscrew. They unscrew, and there were a series of prescription lenses available so you could screw in the prescription that you wanted. Just some interesting old masks. Now, I want to show you something kind of special. This is special to me. I hope it's special to you because it's special to me. And maybe you think it's pretty neat. This is my first mask. The first mask. And this is pre before 1958. I probably started getting interested in the outer water in the early 50s. <clears throat> my dear Uncle Charlie had a cottage in Bowmanville. And maybe you've read the story. It's been published in some magazines about uh, my first dives, my first scuba dive, and my first snorkeling as well. This is my first mask. And I purchased this mask at a, at a hardware store uh, in my hometown a long time ago. And this mask cost $2.98. Well, that's a lot of money. It really is a lot of money. I was working at the time. 
uh, you know, after school and so on, and delivering newspapers, and I was making 25 cents a day. 25 cents a day. So I had to work quite a while to get $2.98. And I was fussy, you know. Um, uh, uh, Mike Nelson, the Seahawn, hadn't started yet, but I was really interested in the MDC world and I wanted to be good at it. I was going to be uh, really, really good at it. You can get this mask in two versions. This mask, if you haven't noticed, has two red knobs on the back. I'm going to pull one of those knobs out. And now, <clears throat> once you pull this knob out, you'll notice there's a hole. That hole actually goes right down inside the mask. What's that for? Well, it's simple. You put a snorkel in that hole, like so. So I could put this snorkel on, and I could swim along and see underwater, and look for undersea treasures in the lakes of Ontario. Not likely too much treasure, but I had a lot of fun. But I didn't buy the mast with the single snorkel. You could buy it in different, ver different versions. Oh, no, no, no. I was going to be a professional scuba diver, so I had to wait, save up the few extra pennies it took, probably an extra 75 cents to get the double version. This is my own mask. It's all dry now. It's not pliable anymore. It certainly doesn't fit my face anymore. But when I was a, a boy, a uh, very young boy in, in Ontario, I had this mask on and I swam around looking for treasure underwater. This idea wasn't uncommon. Here's another mask very similar made by Voight, big, big company, and it's very similar blue rubber, and it also has removable plugs into which you can put snorkels. And here's another version, a little orange one, just a little bit uh, like d a Disney mask, but this was actually a legitimate mask, and it had the snorkels. And these snorkels had ping pong balls. They weren't really ping pong balls, but they looked like a ping pong ball, and they were a dry snorkel. The theory was that as you went down <clears throat> into the water, you see the ping ball would come up and block the tube. It often worked. You caught that digit off and worked. It was far from perfect, but at the time, I was a skin diver. It was fantastic. I was just a young boy. A couple more masks. I just wanted to do this pretty quickly just to give you some ideas. Here's another new mask. And now, if you take a look, you'll see that this mask looks to be identical to this mask. Almost identical. You see? But this mask, <clears throat> with the purge inside, or sorry, with the equalization squeezes, but this mask is one of the very first to have a double seal. It has the outside seal and the new idea of another seal on the inside to help keep water out of the mask. Another mask, kind of interesting, three windows. It actually was flexible, and it had, you could squeeze the nose with this mask. They put this little uh, bump in the lens, and you could squeeze the nose. It had a purge valve on the bottom, so it's getting pretty sophisticated. Pretty sophisticated, yep. Here's a mask that's kind of interesting. It's like the ones I've talked about previously. It's a nice mask, but <laughs> you know what I like about this mask? I like the box. I have lots of my masks. This, this collection, which you see today, by the way, is less than half of my masks. Not even half of my masks, but I like the box, and I have a lot of my masks that are in boxes. And this box is really neat. There's a, a skin diver, and you can see he's got a spear gun, and he's just speared a great big uh, uh, swordfish. I think it's a swordfish, I think, with the spear on it. And the swordfish is about three times as big as him, but he's got this mask on. So he's going to be successful. That was the kind of the advertising we had in those days. This mask was uh, uh, marketed by Healthways, and it was uh, touted as a professional, a serious mask for a serious diver. Pretty neat. The boss was good. Then uh, other masks as well. This is an early mask from, uh, from uh, Sportsways. Sportsways was a well-known company that grew up at that time. And you'll notice something interesting about this mask, besides the monstrous purge on the front, there's something written on the glass. Well, sure, what's written on the glass is Sam Lecoq's signature. Sam Lecoq, a good friend of mine, was the founder of Sportsways, a diving company in the early 60s. I took this mask to him, and he was gracious enough to actually autograph the glass for me. A swim master, another mask. This one's kind of interesting because rather than the double seal, what they did is they put a piece of foam neoprene, which is spongy foam, on the edge. So the spongy foam sealed against your face. Eh, it wasn't a bad idea. It helped a little bit. Helped a little bit. I mentioned earlier that colored masks were not common. They were almost all black. And the reason for that was that coloring the mask didn't work very well. Some of them, they seemed to last. My old green mask is all dried. This blue mask is hanging in there. But most masks, when they added color to the rubber, the coloring destroyed the rubber, uh, the ability of the rubber to stay. So here's a mask that was colored red, white, and blue. This was a special mask from the 70s from, uh, from uh, in North America, from the United States of America. This, this was their centennial a part of their centennial package, but this mass is completely dried. If I tried to move this rubber, it would crack and, and break into small pieces. So colored masks that weren't popular didn't, didn't become very successful until much later. Just some more strange masks. This mask is called the equalizer. Oh, look, the tinted glass, like just like a modern mask. Pretty neat. Same basic style. Piece of glass, strap, 
and so on. Here's another neat old mask. This is from Healthways. It's called a, a dive mask, professional dive mask. This one's made of gum rubber. I don't know if you can see there, but this rubber is almost translucent. You can almost see through it, gum rubber. Same basic style, getting very dry as well. All these old masks get very, very dry with age. You can see some of my collection. Uh, uh, I have a lot of Voight masks, in, in, in original Voight masks and original boxes, all different styles, some with Persia, some with double seals, some without. Here's a neat little mask here uh, called the Nautilus. Uh, it looks like it's for a kid, but actually this is for a diver. Another really, really strange mask was this plastic bowl. You see it there, a plastic bowl with a skirt attached and a strap. Lots and lots of interesting masks. So what I'll do in this vintage uh, scuba playlist, uh, I, I will go to, I'm going to pick some of these masks and spend some time with you and show you some of the strange ones as we go along. So I hope that's giving you some idea of how masks have changed from a piece of rubber fire hose all the way up to the modern silicone mass that you enjoy today. Now before you, before you scoop, before I stop talking, I want to show you over here, a couple of masks over here. Because at one time in the late 60s and even into the 70s, <clears throat> diving with a full face mask was quite popular. So that's a mask that covered your whole face. So you not only could see, but you can breathe through the mask as well. Here's some examples. See, here's a mask here, for example, <clears throat> that goes on your face, and it fastens with several straps. It has a little spider, it was called a spider one, the back and the three or four straps held it firmly against your face. Now this is old, I know it's old because it's only a single seal, and it's black rubber. But once you got this mask on, <clears throat> you could then insert your regulator. Now if you had a good old two-hose regulator, one of the hoses came in here and clamped, and the exhaust hose came in here and clamped on this side. So you put this on, now if you go, put the mask on your face, <sighs> Off you go, breathing right through the mask. So what was the big deal? Well, it was kind of neat because the airflow through the mask would actually keep the glass clear. You already know, you divers, that one of the problems we face is keeping the fog off of that mask. Sometimes this precluded that happening. It has a big purge valve. And I, before you ask, someone's going to ask, how do you equalize? Well, that's a good question because if you try to blow into this mask, the air just goes out the exhaust. How do you build up? You don't. It's really hard to do. But on the inside of this mask, <clears throat> under the nose, right there, there's a little pad of foam rubber sat against your nose the whole time. Felt kind of funny, but it was okay. And when you wanted to equalize, you would take the whole mask, push it up against your nose, and the foam rubber would come up and plug your nostrils, and you could usually get enough air pressure built up to equalize. Yeah, it wasn't perfect, but it worked. There's another another beautiful old uh, uh, full face mask from uh, Aqualung that, uh, that also uh, it takes double hoses, has a purge button on it and the exhaust. This is called the, I think it's called the nasal, this old mask. And another one, here's another one here. Now this one <clears throat> only is good for single hose regulators, not like this one which takes both single hose regulators or double hose. This one for single hose. So the single hose regulator fastened in the front with a clamp, <clears throat> you see, and, and this tube went into that great big hole, and you could actually put your mouth on the inside. That was a good idea because it kept carbon dioxide from building up inside these, these masks. Obviously, they weren't perfect. They had some pitfalls as well, but they were pretty popular. Here's another one. This is a very, very old one, very, very nice one, soft, foamy rubber. And this is a, you see the big window on it. Here's that spider I was talking about. And this mask as well, you could either put a double, yeah, no, this just takes double hose, double hose regulator, and off you would go with this big mask on your face, great for vision, breathing from your regulator as well. One more I want to show you, this mask over here, this looks like a mask, <clears throat> and it's a full face mask, it certainly covers your whole face. This mask I still use this once in a long time when I'm doing demonstrations, but this mask is really unique, because this is not really a mask, it's a regulator. Now, that's not really a regulator, it's a mask. I don't know, it's one or the other. It's a regulator and mask. There's the first stage, connects to the tank, and then the second stage is the actual the mask itself. The hose comes to the top. There's a little lever, maybe you can see it in there, resting on the glass. So when you put this mask on and breathe in, you watch. The glass moves in, pushes on the lever, and you get air through the regulator. Watch this. How about that? This is made by Scuba Bro called the Vision Air. Very rare, very interesting, a neat old mask, and this one's in perfect operating condition. Pretty neat because as the air rushed in, it cleaned the glass off every time. It was pretty neat. A lot of fun. So there's lots of neat stuff, and as I say, this is a very small portion of my vintage mask collection, and I'll be happy to show you some more masks. We're going to talk about snorkels and fins and regulators. Boy, have I got regulators to show you, and all kinds of neat stuff. Communication devices and DPVs. So many things that we've enjoyed over that uh, 50, 60 years of scuba diving. And I'd like to share this with you. If you have questions or comments, or if you've enjoyed this, please let me know. 
I'll do my best to answer as many as I possibly can. I hope you've enjoyed that. This is the very first of our vintage scuba playlist. And I hope you've enjoyed, picked up some ideas there, or just enjoyed uh, as entertainment. And I look forward to talking to you again real soon. Vintage Scuba, Alec Pierce.